Hi, everybody. It's June 26, 2024, and you're at the Recruiting Animal Show with Tommy Alasio Pistachio. No, sorry. That's Pistachio is his mafia name, okay? And Alasio is his <laughs> real name. And his company's called Palermo Roads. And I gave Tom, since he's the only one here, I said, Tommy, you don't have to support the show. If you want to go have lunch or do something, feel free. But he likes talking with me, so who knows what's going to happen. Tommy, here's the first thing I have up. It's a short one, but I liked it. There's a guy, uh, a, a copywriter on Twitter, and uh, his handle is Hey Blake, like H-E-Y Blake. And he said, if you want to write better, fewer commas, more periods. That made terrific sense to me because no commas means no long sentences. You want people to see your message and read it at a glance, just like a resume, okay? No, they, you point. don't want someone to have to study this stuff and you've got all kinds of clauses in your sentences. No, separate ideas. Boom, 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 boom. Fewer commas, more periods. Oh, nice I agree, 100%, especially in any type of outreach message. Yeah, but you don't send I emails. You and, don't send emails, said, do you? No comments. I'm but sorry? You don't, you don't send emails. You don't depend on strangers. Well, I, um, I'm, I'm starting to embrace it a little bit, right? Uh, I have some old school recruiters, some dinosaurs like me that have had some success. So I'm dipping my toes in that a little bit. And when I do do that, it is very short, concise messages. Hi, my name's Tom. I'm wonderful and great. This is what it pays. Call me if you're interested. That's it, right? I don't go into long diatribes or anything like that. I'm very quick and concise. Okay, now you've just blown my mind. Okay, you're sending uh, uh, an email out to a potential candidate you've never spoken to before, right? And what's in the subject line? Oh, let me see. The one I just did, um, I think the first one is the, like similar to what the position title is, right? Like, so um, design build uh, Savannah, Georgia, or something like that, right, is the first subject line. So you know, maybe, in my, I, I, and again, I don't know anything about this. This is kind of just how I, I've kind of just been stumbling through it. But uh, let's see. So this is that one. Okay. So this one right here is. Um, Look, what does it say? Says, heavy, heavy, construction, construction, heavy construction design build. Right. And the second one is uh, Savannah Project Manager. And then the third one's Third Time's a Charm. And then the fourth one is Guy's Name, How's Your Week? Fifth one is vacation or working hard. And the sixth one is, hey, first name. Look, so that's all over the place. So you're using job titles. You're using cute little sentences. How's your week? And they don't know you. And, and how's your week? That would turn me off. I've got to tell well, it's you right the fourth, away. It's the fourth email in the strand, right? So, oh, that's a sequence. Yes, yeah. so the first one is, hey, hey, animal. Uh, you have a job with recruiting animal show, and you don't need a job, right? I've been retained to fill this unique project manager role. What's special? Bullet point, bullet point, bullet point. A little bit about the job. Open to a conversation. That's it. A minute ago, you told us you put the money in. Uh, in this particular one, I put it in the second time. Okay, so you don't always put it in. And this yeah, person, this one is a second time is um, you know one twenty five to one forty five, right? Um, so you, didn't you say, "Hi, my name's Tom. I'm a headhunter." You didn't tell him who you were. No, I didn't. Not in that one. Like I said, I just this, this came from another recruiter that I know that um, has had good success with it. And I asked her to share her cadence with me, and she did. So I figured well, out. Cadence and content are two different things. Cadence is pace. Now the thing is, you've already sent four emails with no reply. Is that what you're telling no, me? No, 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 no. I just started this. This is they all just went out yesterday. The first email. Those right. are not four emails to the same person. Is that what you're saying okay, now? Okay. So let me let me let me back up a second. So I have three um, going. Well, I have two going right now, and a third one that's about to go. So the one I have one I sent to 318 prospects. It was opened by 107 people. Clicked 50 times, and I got eight replies. So, and I haven't got a candidate from it, right? But we'll see what happens. And that is basically. You know, a very, I get a simple email like, hey, I'm trying to fill this position. Would you be interested? Kind of thing. And then in this first one, it says, you know, uh, you have a job. You don't need a job. I'm a headhunter recruiter, and we've been engaged to fill a position with a Fortune 500 company uh, about an hour north of city. Why this company? I'll give three bullet points. And I said, this is for 
you know, a mechanical engineer tech, 95 to 120, depending on experience, that does not include profit sharing or benefits, and the benefits are second to none, open to a conversation. That's the first email that just went out. And then it has a two-day delay, and then the next email is a four-day delay, and then the next email is a two-day delay, and then the next email is a... Okay, you're email. telling us the plan. You're not telling us something that you've already... Uh... Done. Yeah, this is, I just started. Like I said, I don't do a lot of this. This is, you know, this is a first for me. Okay, so we'll have to follow up with you and see how those things are going. Now, I was when... happy with the electrical, and we also did one for. Uh, we're doing a search for people overseas to go to. Uh, well, people in the U.S. that are willing to go to El Salvador, and um, we get, we did we did a really good job with that one. With these emails, yeah. Now, you're like Rich. Rich sends, sends out an email of 400 people. You're sending it out to 300 people. You have that many potential candidates? Yeah, so the one for the um, the one job in El Salvador is for a, a quality control manager. We sent out to 554 people. Uh, we got 192 opens and 33 replies and six candidates interviewing. What email are you using to show you the opens? Is it Loxo? Yeah. Is it Loxo shows you Yeah, the we're opens? using the Loxo. Um, uh what's the applicant tracking uh, system yeah crm so we're using their outreach campaign oh okay okay uh okay so look, i'm curious to see what, what what happens with you since you're you're claiming to be new to it okay uh here's something else the though second one i did is doing horribly so one's I, doing bad one's doing good and one i haven't ran yet so okay well normally if you have 300 people to call or get in touch with how would you get in touch with them if it wasn't by email you phone all of them personally yeah so i usually so um the the stuff we're doing in el salvador is different so i, I don't want to include that but like um i use these 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 cadences eight, outreaches wherever you want to call them for the larger groups that i can't call or it doesn't make sense to call right it's like if, if i'm going to relocate somebody right it, it doesn't make sense to try and call california to see if you want to relocate to georgia but it does make sense to send out a mass email to people in California that are that are solid good candidates with a real quick, hey, if you're willing to move to Georgia, I got this great opportunity, right? So I, that's how I look at this this uh, this email stuff that people are doing. It's for getting uh, that message out to large swaths of people that doesn't make sense to call because you can't use you can't overcome the objection of I can't relocate out of California because my wife and I are divorced and I want to see my kids, you know, like that doesn't make sense. So that guy can get a quick email. Hey, would you move to Atlanta? No, I won't. Thank you. Bye. So no. are you telling us that in the past you would not have phoned that person in California? No, mm -mm. no you would not. I would not have. You never know. Someone might have come from Georgia. And, and where, where do I where do I start, though? Right. So, if, OK, especially on a, on a lower level search, say I need a struck, say I need a mechanical engineer with five years experience and their PE or not even their PE about to get their PE. Right. There's 50,000 of them in the United States as we speak. Where do I start? If I've called everybody at a 30 mile radius of Arlington, right? Who do I call next? Mm -hmm. People in New York, people in California, the, you'll, just, you'll give yourself brain damage. Okay, those 300 people, where'd they come from, LinkedIn? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and which uh, tool did you use to? to sales to Navigator and Sales QL to enrich them, turn it into a CSV and then import them into Loxo. Okay, now I saw someone saying he got into LinkedIn jail and he's not even using any scraping technology. So someone told him the following. You probably know more about this than me. He said, if you look at the profiles too quickly, even without tech, that's the easiest way to get put into LinkedIn jail. So, okay, and again, I, I'm, from my experience, it all comes down to are you paying for it or not? If you're not paying for LinkedIn, if you're not having an and I think there is something to do with where, what country, if you're in the US, right, you get a little more leeway. And if you're paying, you get more leeway. So I pay for Sales Navigator, I'm in the United States, and I have scraped five, 600 profiles in a day, right? I have looked at hundreds and hundreds of profiles in a day. I have not gotten any type of warnings from LinkedIn. I got one warning very long ago when I used Jobin's um, connection request feature and I let it run for too long, like for like 27 hours it ran or something. And they realized that I was, obviously I wasn't working for 27 hours straight. What you have to understand is a lot of these software tools, scrapers, whatever, they run at human speed. So if you're running a scraper and looking at LinkedIn, you're gonna get nailed. If you run it for too long, you're gonna get nailed. So you have to just think about it like if 
you were a human, how many profiles could you look at? How many people could you download? That's how you have to look at it. So I could look at 500 profiles in a day. I downloaded 500 profiles using the scraper and never got in trouble. But I also pay for it. Okay. Now, I assumed that every recruiter pays for LinkedIn. But well, recruiter, the, the ones that take all the Boolean search string. Uh, courses, yeah, you, you, you might be right. Stuff. Pay for it. Someone asked this person, although there was no reply, are you paying? And I thought, well, isn't it, of course he's paying. But now you're telling me, no, I know that Dean doesn't pay. <laughs> yeah, tons of recruiters don't pay that are really good at Boolean because you don't need to pay. But I thought they were blocking you, blocking you out from. Uh, we did on, on, on uh, the round table. Uh, we did uh, a whole thing with Dean and someone else, or uh, what's his name, uh, Brian Fink, that said, like, hey, this is not happening. Like, the, all the scariness, all the all the bullion still works. I ran some string. I don't do a lot of bullion strings, but I wanted to kind of, like, run a different couple bullion strings against uh, this software that calls itself Coolian or something. And I was getting kind of the same results, right? Uh -huh. So if you know how to do it, and I'm not very good at it at all. Now, how, how have you taught yourself? I, 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 I realized I thought I knew most of the basics, and I went looking for somebody on LinkedIn for for a posting, not not for a search. And uh, I posted my results in in my Facebook group, and then Irina Shemaeva, who's a pro, she did the same search on LinkedIn and came up with a, a list. I don't want to say 10 times longer, but it was, I was yeah. blown away. I yeah, mean, the ones that really know it. I mean, Dean DaCosta really knows his stuff. So does Steve Levy. Uh, Brian, I mean, Steve Levy is get, is showing me stuff I didn't know existed. How you do date ranges. Uh, you don't have to do, and I mean, there's all kinds of stuff these guys know how to do that I am completely uh, uh, alien to. So, okay. yeah, if you have good bullion skills, I don't think you need LinkedIn. But then again, downloading the profiles and all that you're going to get nailed for that too but i they they figure it out somehow okay uh, this person said uh, also if you're using some kind of chrome extensions and you leave the tabs open while you're in linkedin that can cause uh, going to linkedin jail as well i well, never I mean, heard back, I never heard of that before it goes back to um, when you're doing a okay i'll give you an example right so if i'm doing one of these searches and i go into the linkedin sales navigator and i put in Title project manager, area Chicago, uh, mechanical engineering, and, and mecha in quotes, mechanical engineering and HVAC, right? And let's say I, I get 400 people. I put them in a leads list. I can look at them really quick and grab the ones that I like and put them in a leads list. Once I have that leads list, let's say it's 300 people in that leads list, then I use the scraper to grab them out of the leads list. There's a reason to have all those tabs open, especially if you use Sales Navigator because you can, they have that mini view on the right-hand side where you can boop, 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 look at the guys really quick and decide, and then just tag the ones you want, add the list, tag the ones you want, add the list. And then, you know, I can, I can run through 500 profiles and probably... 10 minutes, 15 mm -hmm. minutes, and mm -hmm. grab the third 300. And you're you're still a, a devoted fan of Sales Navigator. You're the biggest promoter I've seen of Loxo because and Sales Navigator. If you don't use Open to Work, right? If you don't deal with active candidates and you you do, if you use Open to Work all the time and you get lots of candidates that are open to work and you place them, then you need recruiter, right? And if you if emails is part of your world and you send hundreds of emails every month. Then you need a uh, recruiter. But if you are like me and most other other people that I talk to who are looking for passive candidates, send it an in mail every now and then because you can't get a hold of a guy and don't worry about open to work. There's the navigator is because we I have done side by side searches and I will I will die on this hill. I have done side by side searches with people who have the full recruiter license against me with my navigator for seventy nine dollars and their recruiter for you know seventy nine hundred dollars. And we get the same results within 10 to 15 people every single time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, really dope, that's good news. Especially I didn't know that you actually gauged it, measure, measured it. Dominic uh, Minnelli and I did it. Uh, Kelly Nelson and I did it. And I did it with one other person. And Kelly's, all three times. Kelly's, Kelly's, is Kelly's got a recruiter? She did. I think she went to Navigator too because I showed her how to do it. Oh, okay. Okay, here's something that uh, I'd love to, I uh, will throw at Rich uh, as well when he comes back. This guy said, retain, and I believe this, I'm with this guy in this, retained can be a trap. He said, I've seen firms get stuck on retained searches for 18 months. Meanwhile, a contingent recruiter generated 20 times the revenue, okay? 
Everybody's you always for, promoting. You might get it. Pardon me? Be careful what you ask for. You might get it. Okay. You ask for an engagement fee. If you were in some tough, some tough search that was going on forever, what would you do? Say, I'm giving you back the engagement fee? Because there are people who say, give them back their retainer and, and get out of that search. It depends. Okay, so that's, a, a, again, I, I love how you like to generalize. Oh, you know, it's it all depends on the search, right? So if if all the parameters need to, and this is why I love bringing up how we do our searches, like with Loxo and the reporting that we do, right? If I, um, when I start an engaged search, the first thing that I do is I present to the client, these are the 120 people we're going to call, right? Or 98 people or whatever it is, right? So I write, I, I talk with the client, I write the search, they give me the parameters, right? As long as it, it seems reasonable, money, yada, yada, I know my industry. Then we write a, we do a report, we send the report, we go, here are the 120 people we're going to call. I want you to look at this report. I want you to redline anybody that um, you've interviewed in the past, that you know, slept with your wife, that you wouldn't interview, that stole from you, whatever it is, or, or a company maybe you're doing work with and you don't want us to recruit from. And then maybe circle guys that, oh, we would love if you could get this guy, or that's a great company to recruit from. Once you've done that, then we'll go to town and start recruiting. Now, what's really cool about that is, while my team is recruiting, they'll take notes. They call John Smith, they pitch him the job. He says, hey, uh, sounds like you're a great opportunity. They're 20,000 too low. So he writes that down. Go to the next guy. Okay, the thing. All of a sudden, hey, stop. All of a sudden, you have um, all this information, right? Where the company's too low, the benefits aren't good enough, the car allowance isn't enough, and then you can go back to the client and show them the report versus saying it to them. If you call a client up and say, "Look, we've been working on this search for two weeks. Everybody's making more money than you want to pay." Do they believe you? Maybe, maybe not. If you actually present them with a report that shows, look, we've called 72 people. Of those 72 people, 54 are making at your top or better. What do you want us to do? Now you have ammunition that can say, raise the salary, lower the expectations, or what does she want to do? And if they're not being reasonable, we've done our due diligence. You're paying me to search, to do this, to search and call these 87 people and present you all the information. If none of these 87 people want to work for you, that is not my problem. I did what I told you I was going to do for so my three Are you saying hours. that you will walk away from the search at that point if they are not flexible? Is that what yeah. you're telling me? I did. I did what I told you I was going to do. You didn't pay me Three thousand or five thousand. They're not going to understand. Search. They are not going to understand. Okay, and, and you will get bad uh, a word of mouth. Uh, no, 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 animal. When you sell it the right way, I have clients that call me up and say, "Tom, we want you to do this search. We have an internal candidate, but can you see if there's anybody better?" And I said, "Sure," and I'll and I'll send them the list. We'll redline it. I'll go do the search. Five thousand dollars. I'll give them the report and go here. This is the only other the only guy who's better than the candidate you have, and he's not interested, or there's these seven guys, or whatever it is. And they go, thank you, we're gonna go with our internal guy. That's, isn't that funny, everybody, how he comes up with this special situation where no, we're no, no, already- No, 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 I want to know how you sell that engagement fee, because you told me sometimes they'll say, I don't want to pay uh, 3,000 or 5,000 in advance. Well, you know, you haven't given me anybody. You know, and what do you say? Look, I'm going to charge you that money just to check out the territory. Okay. I'll tell you what. Um, let me ask you a question, Animal. Do you take your books and give it to three different accountants and they have to say, hey, whoever gets my books done first, they get paid? No. Okay. Why do you expect me to do that? Yeah, but here's the point. You're willing to walk away after you got that 3000 You have to tell them that or after your 5000 If I don't I think do tell them that. I tell them that we charge a $5,000 engagement fee to execute the search. Then if you hire someone, it's an additional 25% of the base salary. The 3000 or $5,000 That's not what you just told me, okay? The story you just told was that you did the initial search, okay? There's a couple of things here. First of all, you give them uh, a, a whole report 
of the people that you, uh, the pro like these 300 or 125 people. I would never give them that information. All the sourcing information, they don't need you anymore. They can give it to some somebody else to call those. Okay, people. if that, they've already paid me, okay, the 3,000 or the 5,000. And that is what I sell. I sell that this is a, a relationship of us let, let me finish. No, no, you're dead. Let me finish, okay? Yeah. I've given you lots of rope to hang yourself at this yeah, point. I'm, I'm... Yeah, okay. So hold on a second. So you've you've done this. Uh, you say, oh, I, I, I'm charging them $5,000 to do the search. If they hire somebody, then I charge them a 25% fee. That's really not what's happening. You're not doing the full search. A search means that you, you know, send them a candidate that they're ready to hire, okay? That's what I consider a search. What you're talking about is you source, you do the initial sourcing. That's what you're charging them for, the sourcing. It's beyond sourcing though, because you're 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 sourcing and then you're recruiting the candidates. You know what, that's called sourcing, that's called sourcing these days, okay? I call that recruiting as well, but that that's called candidate development. You source the people, you do the candidate development, and then, you know, in a corporation, they hand them over to somebody else to handhold the candidate, okay? But really, the sourcer does all the work, <laughs> at least in my opinion. Although, you know, uh, I've had a fight with Amy about that. She says, I close the deals, okay? They can't do that. I'm more important than they are. Well, just, well I mean, <laughs> if Amy's good at what she does, but what it, what it comes down to is that um, she can't make a hire. Let's not talk about her. We'll get in trouble. No, okay, I'm sorry. Well, a talent acquisition person cannot make it a hire, right? They can suggest, they can sell, they can help close. But if the hiring manager says, I don't want to hire Steve Jones, that talent acquisition person can't override them. Okay. But if you, if you, uh, so, so let's say you're actually on a search. Uh, no, no, but my point was that you say, look, I'm going to do all the sourcing. These are a hundred people I think that might be good for the job, but we've spoken to half of them already. And the position is not, uh, feasible at this salary range okay so you have to put up it and they say no and you say look i'm walking away from this it's not no, I, I'll, say, I'll finish the i'll finish the list but be warned this is where we are in the process right that at, we've already called you know i i i, I want to say if i'll go back and look at my list my list probably don't go above 100 usually somewhere between 60 and 80 ish people and i say look we've already called 47 people you are nowhere near where you need to be compensation wise. What do you want us to do? And they say, nothing. We want you to call the rest of the people. Okay. And when I come back and say, we've called all the people, what do you want to do now? We'll get us more people. They don't exist, right? You, we told you what we were going to do. We've presented you everybody that's out there. No one could, I can't create something from nothing. I'm not a magician. Okay. Has it ever happened that you've actually said, look, I'm going to resign from the search? No, okay, it's theoretical. Uh, you, you have to give me, dude, I've been doing this for 26 years. Okay? Well, no, if, you second. know what? Here's the thing. If you actually, if it actually happened, you would have able, been able to give it to me off the top, the top of your head. If you have to think about it, it's got to be very rare. I mean, it's got to it be very rare. rare. It is very rare because I okay. usually fill the position, but it has happened. I, I just have to think about like who it happened with. You know, there was a search in Chicago. Where they paid no oh, oh, oh back, back with Dag and Cole. I don't do work with them anymore, but they, we did a search for them in, in California and we they they said okay, we understand. There was no ill will. We deal, we worked for them after that a few more times, but it stuff happens. Like clients sometimes understand it's how you sell the process, it's how you sell the search, it's the relationship that you have. Now you cannot keep taking money from people. I don't do that, it's not my, my plan, right? And if and, and I ask you this question, if I'm doing the search and they hire an internal candidate, I keep the money and I go, okay, thanks. We're done. I'll do that all the time. Okay. Well, not all the time, but that's happens no, that's way more times. That's like a retained the search. If they, whoever gets hired, it's uh, you get paid. But, but here's something else that uh, I consider a fault of mine that you just uh, mentioned. If, if you say, look, I've done this, I've gone through all these people. And they say, we well, you know, we want to see someone else. And you say, there's nobody else, okay? I always assume there's somebody out there. I can't make that statement. There's all there's going to be somebody who's good for that job who will take it at that salary. I just haven't run into them yet, okay? But you don't want to, that's where, that's where I thought, you don't want to hang yourself if on this retained search 
uh, you, you, because you got paid in advance, you have to keep looking for that person. I mean, and it's, it's, it's it, that's when it becomes a ridiculous money losing. Yeah, um, and I guess it's, it's engaged. having the experience to know when not to take on a search like that, right? Like, when but you just the, said you don't know. You don't know till you get out there, and then you no, discover no, 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 that no, no, the pay no, no, is too no. low. Again, that's why I said, like, when you're doing the search, if these, these are the things that can happen. Okay, but if you're good at taking the job order and you can tell them up front, hey, you need to be at this salary range, or hey, this education isn't available. You know, one of the recruiters that called me and asked for help on the search she was doing, and she took it on an engagement or retained basis, and they wanted. Realist, realistic, unrealistic. Um, uh, they wanted them to have these three different certifications, A, B, and C, right? And uh, there was tons of people with C, and tons of people with A, and tons of people with B, and a couple with A and C, and a couple with B and C. There was like two guys in the whole country that had A, B, and C. What are you doing? That they don't exist. She didn't know that going in. But what well, do you do? If there's something else that speaks for having a, a niche, a fairly narrow niche. You know all that stuff, presumably, after a while, right from the start. <clears throat> I've had to do so many general, uh, general, you know, general searches, and I don't discover that stuff till I've called twenty people, okay, or thirty, or like you said, fifty, right? But even you said, you know, sometimes you call a bunch of people, and that's when you discover how realistic uh, the search is. Like, you don't always know. You don't always know in advance, okay? Yeah, it, it's uh, there's there's um. The, the designations for engineers is a PE and a SE in the United States, and then PNG in California, in uh, Canada, right? I had a search one time where they wanted a guy with a PE and SE and a PNG. Now, this is a long time ago. I took it on contingency. Do you know how many people in the U.S. have all three of those um, structural engineering designations? No. Probably less than 200, and most of them are partners. Mm -hmm. It's like super hard to have all three of those things. So what was I thinking taking on that search? I didn't know any better. It was in my younger days. But today, if tomorrow, if someone called me and said, hey, we want these three things, that is $10,000 up front because I don't know if I can fill it, but I will call every single person in the U.S. who has those three See, designations. Some, some people would say, look, if you're going to turn down hard searches, you're not a real headhunter. That's why people come to you because you're going to look for things that There's are hard to find. Between a hard search and a unrealistic search. And that's what you have to understand as an expert, right? If someone said to you, "We want a we want a project manager who could, who's making forty thousand dollars and has his MBA," you're going to take that search on? I'm assuming not, right? Yeah. Forty thousand these days. Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, like, I'm, I'm being facetious because that's that's extreme. But if you're good in your niche and you know your niche, then you know how to do these searches, and you tell uh -huh. them you're being unrealistic. And if you want me to look for this, if you want me to look for a, an engineer with 10 years experience who has his PE, his SE, and his PNG, I will do that. It will cost $10,000. Okay. Let me go back to giving them the whole list in advance of the people you're going to target. You don't, you don't lose money that way? They don't just put that in their, in their database and, and use those people in the future? The searches that I do are not, tend not to be um, – they have 30 of these people, right, or 50 of these people at their company. Right. It's I work with medium sized companies, except for my biggest client. Right. And I still work on them, which you could call contingency. But I'm the, one of the only eight recruiters the company uses. If I want an engagement fee, I just tell them, hey, send me three grand. They do it. Right. And they don't expect the, the reports. But for everybody else. Right. The smaller companies I work for. Right. They don't hire 15 of these or 19 of these. So and if they give me a search, it's because, they, you know, Hey, Tom, this is very important to us. We need this CFO, right? Okay, I did a CFO search. They, they can have the whole fucking CFO list. They're only going to hire one CFO. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's a CFO. But what if it's more junior people? I mean, that they're going to be hired. I don't usually take, I don't usually get. Not this. junior, junior, but, you know, okay. Like director okay. of sales, sales manager, director of sales. They only hire one. Okay. Okay, yeah, right. that's a pretty good answer. Three that's a managers. pretty good answer, everybody. He gave me he, he gave me a good rebuttal. Okay, uh, I, he put me in my place. Maybe <laughs> you know you know why though? Because I'm just not quick enough today to come up with uh, a better. Hey, let me but slap you animal, around, animal, please, and everybody watching. Nothing is foolproof. Nothing works every time, and there's an exception to every rule. I'm not saying that have I have I been screwed over? Maybe I have. I don't know that, but I try to have relationships with my clients. That are not, that are very you know 
deep relationships that go on for years. So they wouldn't do that to me. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to switch gears entirely. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. What time is it? Boy, we're moving fast and uh, I'm, having a real, uh, I'm having a fun time. Okay. Um, <laughs> I am. This is a fantastic discussion in my opinion. Okay. Um, because the thing is, because you say stuff that, that's good, but you get challenged as well, and you have to uh, justify it. I enjoy, what about, I enjoy that. Okay. What about this? Uh, you ask your client what the company culture is, and he says, summer Fridays are for losers. <laughs> summer Friday. That's when you take half a day off on Friday in, in, the, in the summer, every Friday. Um, would you work that search? Uh, again? More to it, but yes. It doesn't like sound good. It doesn't sound it, it good, does to, it? You have to find a company that, you know, or candidates that, that work at a company that don't have summer Fridays, right? So they don't care that there's not summer Fridays. It's like work from home or hybrid or, or work in yeah, the office, Okay, right? but did you see did you see how you phrased it? Summer Fridays are for losers. That's nasty. Okay. There's yeah, something but is he wrong telling there. You that at, so you know now what type of manager person is, right? He has high expectations. He, you know, wants everybody to put in 110%, right? So you have to stay, know that going in, that you have this difficult client who has high expectations of candidates. Are you going to work the search? Okay, I call it uh, some more than just high expectations. I call is it Someone who says work from home is for losers. Do you work with that guy? Uh, that's, you know, a very good example. Uh, I don't know. I guess so because, uh, you know. Lots of companies don't have work from home policies, right? I have clients that point blank, as soon as COVID was over, back to the office, right? They did everything in the power not okay, to work apparently, from home. You know, apparently, those those uh, work from home uh, uh, jobs are just disappearing like, uh, like uh, the morning. Some companies are doing it, but nowhere near what it was, Yeah. right? right. So so that you have to ask yourself, you know, if, if you're going to jump into that search, does it bother you that he said that? Can you find candidates? Well, could you say to him, "Listen, them. listen, Mary, uh, that sounds a bit tough. Uh, is that are you? Are you a tough manager? Do you have a, a tough attitude generally, or could you yeah, actually say like, that?" So, so could you, was, you know, if he said that to me, "Summer Fridays for losers," I say, "Well, do well, hold up, like just until I get this straight." That's the type of management style you have. I mean, you are a you are a no nonsense. You work hours. I work. I'm here. You're here. Elon Musk style, and wait to see what he says. You sound like a tough cookie, Mary. Is that is that fair? So you think that would turn her off? Is that worth if risking? It does, if it does, then you saved yourself. That, that's you, you. You tend to forget it's okay to fire clients. It's okay to walk away from searches. So if she gets offended by that, then guess what? It wasn't worth taking the search on anyway. Okay. Now I got a whole list. Uh, I don't think we'll get to them necessarily. Of uh, Rich gave a. I, Rich is posting more uh, comments. You know, Richie Rich. He's not here today, but he's America's recruiter. Okay, and he is now offering. We're going to do an ad for Rich, even though he's not here. He's offering to teach you to be a super recruiter, just like him. Okay, you can either go to go to cornerstonesearch.com uh, i think uh, rich at cornerstonesearch.com is his email or as tom said moore essentials but you can go straight to rich he offers on thursday mornings at a quarter to nine eastern a.m uh, a group session where you and a bunch of other uh recruiters get together and and tell all your problems and uh, it's strictly confidential and uh, he does one-on-one -on -one as well okay so he is I, I believe trying to promote himself now because I saw he gave a whole list of uh, tips to a new recruiter that I thought I thought were very good and I would get to them but I have another question that I want to ask you first and one but the reason I brought that up is one of the things Tom just said hey you got to walk away from tough looking clients and that's Rich's basic principle walk away from bad clients okay now to me it seems like he doesn't always do that okay that it's a good theory yeah, I mean, we, we, we make mistakes we get stuck into bad searches we get stuck with bad clients it happens okay but he doesn't have great radar for that all the time okay that's my opinion based on and he can argue with me when he comes back okay but here i posted something and i was shocked that there were so many negative reactions this guy said you have to qualify when you call someone up for a job, a potential uh, recruit, you have to qualify that person before you present the job. 
I like presenting the job directly. This is why I'm calling. I'm not wasting your time, uh, blah, blah, blah. And also, because I work as a generalist, you know, I can't promise the person, tell me something about your background, because even if we don't work on this, I'll be back, because I won't. Um, uh, uh, but lots of people said, hey, I'm not going to put up with you grilling me about my background without telling me why you're calling first. I want to I, I want to hear the job right up front. And they were very adamant about it. I thought all niche recruiters generally interview the candidate a bit. They screen the candidate before they present the job. What's your take on that, Tommy? Yeah, I, I would agree. So I, I feel like the, the work that I do on Navigator, building my lists, I know that these people are relatively on paper qualified for the job. They have the education, the, the minimum years of experience. So I, I don't yeah. need, I can pitch them the job right away. Hi, this is Tom Alasio. I know you're busy. I'll be brief. Uh, I'm a headhunter. I specialize in mechanical engineering. We were retained by one of my top clients, search for an individual with a high degree of skill in mechanical engineering as it relates to HVAC and plumbing uh, design build. I have no reason to believe you're looking to make a job change. However, I wanted to see if you open talking to me about this opportunity. And then that's right. But I also had a pitch and I was trying to remember this guy's name was a trainer from a long time ago. And he had this pitch that was kind of falls into that where it's hi, hi animals is Tom Alasio. I'm a headhunter. I specialize in mechanical engineering. Uh, I'm working on a couple confidential searches in your area. Now I have no reason to believe you're looking to make a job change. However, I wanted to see if you share a little bit of your background with me and your goals to see if maybe one of the positions I'm working on hits a few of your hot buttons or just for down the road for the future is now a good time to talk. It's a very generic kind of, way and i actually got a candidate from that when i first heard it the structural engineer that i placed in tennessee and it works but it's also a, you're going to get a shot down a lot too but if you do get the right guy then you can qualify him completely and he as a, he or she is a little more open because you were a little more like hey i'm just calling you to see if you're willing to share you know your goals and your background with me to see if a couple of the searches i'm working on hit your hot buttons versus i have this job right so it can be done both ways it just depends on how you want to go about it and how how you think the search is going to impact the candidate you're calling. Well, I think there's also a trainer. I won't mention the name because I'm not sure it was him, but he had what he called institutional calls. So he would call people in his niche, potential recruits, and screen them. And he would say, look, I'm not calling you about a search. I just want to get to know you for the future. Yeah. Do you think that's, I mean, that's worthwhile? That's kind of what LinkedIn is now. When you connect with people on LinkedIn, like – a lot of times I'll I'll say, hey, I'm connecting because I do a lot of work in engineering and wanted to connect with you. You know, you can do that and then build your network that way. You can you can just call people. I mean, like if you don't have a search, which, you know, or, or you feel like the search is not. a This is a great example. If it's not a great search to do the do the do the the uh, whatever that guy called it thing, institutional calls. If you and then you start talking to somebody, you get somebody who's underpaid. Now you hit their hot buttons. Hey, uh, by the way, I do have a search in your backyard. It it pays more than you're making. It's or you could simple. find you could find the most placeable candidate that way, someone to yeah, market. Exactly. And you hundred yeah. percent can do that. I have I have a friend and he always said he was a big biller and he always says, make a hundred calls, you're gonna get make some money out of it. It doesn't even matter what the calls are, just get on the phone. hundred candidates, you will find a diamond in the rough, you'll find a candidate for your search, and you'll find an NPC. Make 100 marketing calls. You'll get a search. May not be the search you want, but you'll get a search. Think so? 100? Is that all it takes? Everybody's crying. I see these guys crying. Yeah. Maybe hey, they're so IT. What type of search is it, bro? Right? Like, is, you know, you can get a continuous. I, I guarantee you, I don't want to say, you know, in my industry, right now, I can make 100 phone calls and easily get three or four searches. I'm sure you could do that in nursing. I'm sure they can do it in healthcare, probably banking, manufacturing, maintenance, construction of any kind. Right, IT maybe not. Right, I hear IT is not doing well. VC is not doing well. Startups that might be harder. But I guarantee, if I got on the phone right now and called a hundred manufacturing facilities, and could find a search for a maintenance tech or a maintenance manager or something like that, there's no doubt in my mind. It would be contingency. It might be twenty or twenty five percent, but I'd find them. Okay, and here's one of the tips from from Rich. I'll just go, go to one of them. Make sure you're working similar roles. Don't be a generalist. I'm going to agree with him. Some people disagree. Yeah. I agree, and I'm talking from yeah. bitter experience. Uh, um, the only generalist is if you generalize in like an area. I place only in Baltimore City, right? I guess you could do that. 
you were known as the recruiter in Baltimore City. Yeah, that, that's you're still the yeah. Well, you know, I remember you like uh, Steve Finkel, and uh, if I remember correctly, he said uh, you know he was working all kinds of jobs. He uh, he somebody gave him a job for some kind of accountant or something like that. He said I placed him in the morning. It's like eating popcorn. I remember that was his. Uh, <laughs> he phrase, also right? says there's two types of niches: vertical and horizontal. Yeah. So you can place accountants across hundreds of industries, or you could you could work um, healthcare, right? Uh, nursing, that, doctors. That's, yeah, that's hardly if you're placing nurses and doctors and accountants in healthcare. That's that's a wide range of jobs. I don't know how so how someone can call that a niche. Like, um, I work. One of my niches is what I call engineered products, and I place a variety of candidates positions in those roles because i understand the 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 industry it's a smaller niche industry so i understand the industry so i can place sales operations uh project managers estimators you know all these different positions. really i don't i don't follow it i mean how because i understand because it's the industry the industry is very unique but do you understand those specific jobs well enough to yes, distinguish because between? because it's taking a good job order right so i understand they want people who have similar backgrounds without giving too much away Let, let's just say it's um uh, uh a wood trusses let's say wood trusses wood design um that, those type of things right there's companies that manufacture wood trusses now they have people in the manufacturing they have plant managers they have sales reps who got and sell the wood trusses they have engineers and estimators who design and estimate the wood trusses right they have customer service people right so if and then they have accountants or whatever so if i'm if a wood trust company called me and wanted the project manager I get to search for the project manager because I understand wood trust is inside and out. I know the whole industry. I know all the competitors. I know all the places that have them. So I can call the project managers at all the wood trust companies and find a guy. They want an estimator. If they want a sales guy, I know all the sales guys or I know all the wood trust companies in Florida. And who are the sales reps for them? Go out and find who the sales reps are and say, hey, I have a, I have a new wood trust company. That's expanding. Okay, but that's different. Yeah. See, you won't be able to recognize if the money is right for the sales reps, okay? Because you don't know anything about sales reps at that point. Right, you're going to discover that when you go out onto the source. Yeah, and you're going to ask that question. How did you know you want to pay a fifty thousand dollar base and you pay one percent of sales? Is that standard for your industry? What have you seen? You know, you those are those are questions you ask an employer when they. Yeah, but we hold, just said before they don't always give you the right information. Right, they don't. Right. They and don't you know can the market. Get stuck into those roles. That's what go, you go okay. back. And say, and that's where we started calls. talking. And where we started talking about niches is you said you're going to know right away even before you know he's going to tell you what he's looking for and you said no that's not going to work i don't even have to go out and call 100 people uh, again um i've experienced it i've grown up in the industry i'm going to know these things now starting out of course you're not okay but even if you took a job for a salesman tomorrow and you're not a sales recruiter generally you're going to be in a position where you're essentially working almost without that niche. Now, it's interesting that you mm -hmm. know all the companies and wood trusts already, but you're not recruiting sales reps in that industry. So I'm going to argue with you. Let's move on. I want to ask this question before we're, we're done. I had it specifically okay. for, for you and Rich. You, can, <laughs> you I'll ask him when he comes back. Okay, Roger Federer, the famous tenor play, tennis player, okay? okay? He said, effortless work is a myth, okay? There's a super, one of the best athletes in history, let's say, okay? He said, building the mental strength and discipline required to become the top tennis player for him was a big struggle, okay? Now, you guys seem to find it effortless to recruit, and I always attribute that to your personalities, okay? Um, and uh, I'm wondering if, if it, does it take effort for you to work, or is it really effortless? It sounds like to me you have no problem picking up the phone and saying whatever you have to say to anybody. And you say, look, I don't care if they don't like me. I have no inhibitions. Uh, so, and, and you, you're quite happy doing even these uh, uh, sourcing, uh, sourcing hundreds of candidates and then doing the emails and stuff. It sounds to me like it's a knife going through butter when you talk about work, working. Uh, and, but it's never been like that for me. I mean, when I started out, it, I mean, I, you, you know, I, I paid my dues. I got my licks. Well, you I, were one of the guys just like Rich who, who became superstars right away. And you, you've you attributed it to your experience in uh, bartending, which uh, maybe I'll give you a bit of credit for that. So, but no, so, you don't say it was a struggle. I've never heard you say it was a struggle. No, but I'm also not Roger Federer and not even close in the, in the world of recruiting. 
right? And Rich is really good. I don't think he's Roger Federer, as good as Rich is, right? I mean, you're talking about the 0.001% of the athletes in tennis, right? So, um, or, you know, there are probably tennis prodigies out there that it was effortless for them, but they never won a Grand Slam or a Masters, right? And that's like me. It's somewhat effortless for me, but I've never been the number one recruiter in the world or, you know, whatever. So I, I think it's a balance there. Right to get to the level of a of a Federer, to get to the level of the number one of anything, yes, yeah, it's not effortless. Okay, I don't think that's what he meant. He was speaking more generally, but I, but you raised an interesting point. Who would be at that level? What's a recruiter at that level? I mean, remember the guy who? Uh, hold on a second. I mean, it's money. I, I guess is it Excuse money? Me. Is it is it like, Is it money? I, you know, like a, a guy who's doing $5 million by himself, right? Like, remember, I, don't know, I don't know what the number one recruiter is. Remember when uh, Steve Jobs recruited John Scully, who turned out to be, uh, uh, fired him? <laughs> he turned out to be his nemesis. He wasn't the greatest hire, I guess. Um, he, he sold him by saying, look, he was a Pepsi. And he says, do you want to be famous for making brown water? Or do you want to lead the computer revolution? Okay. And that was... John Scully said that's the line that sold him. Okay. So that's a great line. It is, right? <laughs> but that's a great I had never heard that. That's a great line. Okay, but it was a bad hire for, for, for Steve. He got fired by the CEO he hired. Okay. He was, sounds like he was an impossible person, uh Steve Steve. And the company him. almost went under, and it wasn't until Steve came back and saved the company that it got better. So, you know, uh you yeah, wonder, but you it know was what? Definitely a bad hire. Okay, but his time out in the pasture working with Pixar and stuff. That probably made him capable of rescuing the company. Okay, there's a probably. he had to suffer in Egypt before he could come back to the promised <laughs> promised land. To use a, a religious uh, analogy. Okay, for all you religious folks who uh, we have the religious. We didn't talk politics before yeah, the show that's started. That's an interesting. Today. That's an interesting um, comment by Federa, and I really don't know how to 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 to. to to answer that because it did, you know, like Rich and I both, it did come easy to us very early on. I mean, I started in October and I was the rookie of the region the fall, you know, the, in January, I was knocking it out of the park. Okay. So here's a follow-up for that. Sam Altman, you know, the AI guy, if you're familiar. Okay. He says, it's easy to have momentum if you're doing something that interests you. I say it doesn't take effort if you're doing something that fits with your personality. That's exactly what I say. Okay. Yeah, it's something that I love. Right. Oh. So I, I enjoy. I love this job. I enjoy what I do. So yeah. You actually love the job. You love oh, it. Yeah, I love this job. Yeah, I love this job. It's my second favorite job in the world. Yeah. Okay. What's your most? Bartending. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. You like it? Yeah. If I could make the kind of money I make recruiting as a bartender, I would bartend. I would start bartending tomorrow. Oh, really? Okay. I love. I absolutely love the interaction. I love the, um, the constant flow of different people constantly. The the feet, everything about it. The flair. I I you know the fun, making the drinks, recommending drinks, talking about wine, all that. I love all that stuff. What hours? What about the hours though? Yeah, I mean that's the thing too. Like uh, that's why I got out of it because I was you know I had to work Christmas and holidays and all that. So yeah, but again, if I could make the kind of money that I'm making now in a in a similar type situation. Maybe I'm working a pool bar. Maybe I'm working on the beach in, in Jamaica, right? I own, own a bar in Jamaica and I'm making half a million dollars a year. Then that's what I would do, but I can't do that. So this is the second best thing. <laughs> okay. And on that happy note, uh, I'm going to say thanks. I really enjoyed our conversation. Anything right. else? No. Palermo <laughs> Rhodes, super recruiter. He's a super recruiter. You could yeah. tell him he's ready to argue. He doesn't back away. He doesn't get angry. He's there for any discussion you want to have about recruiting. Anytime. And the Recruiter Roundtable, 1230 every Friday. Well, yeah, on Fridays, 1230 Eastern. Don't mm -hmm. forget. it's a We're, having a, we're actually getting a, a lot of um, people. Are, I mean, we get, last time we had like 14 people show up. And, you know, I had 30 views by the time it was posted. So it's getting a lot of attention. Okay, um, it like shows it. better than mine. I'm losing all my people, but I'm keeping the most interesting people. Okay, well, thank you. And I enjoy this um, because Format. you bring up good topics, and uh, I don't have to host. <laughs> okay, talk to you later. Take Peace care. Out.